This is Just Asking Questions, a show for inquiring minds on reason. Should kids medically transition between genders? Just asking questions. I'm Zach Weissmuller, senior producer for Reason, joined by my co-host, Reason Associate Editor and author of the Reason Roundup, Liz Wolf. Hey, Liz. Hey, Zach. The number of kids diagnosed with gender dysphoria has surged in recent years. In America, diagnoses have almost tripled from about 15,000 to more than 42,000 between 2017 to 2021. In the United Kingdom, the number of minors referred to the National Gender Identity Development Service grew from 51 in 2009 to 1,766 by 2016, leading to years-long wait lists for care within the government-run health system. That surge caused England's National Health Service to commission an extensive study of youth gender treatment. That study is known as the CAS Review, and its results dropped on April 10th. The review's author, former head of the Royal College of Pediatrics, Hilary Cass, concluded that modern youth gender dysphoria interventions are informed by, quote, remarkably weak evidence drawing on studies exaggerated by people on all sides of the debate to support their viewpoint, and that we have no good evidence on the long-term outcomes of interventions to manage gender-related distress. The science, it turns out, is not settled or anywhere close to it. And NHS England opted to stop routine prescriptions of puberty blockers following the review's publication, as have NHS Scotland and the Welsh government. Major American medical groups like the American Psychiatric Association, American Medical Association, and American Academy of Pediatrics, all of which endorse prescribing puberty blockers for gender dysphoric kids, have yet to officially respond. American media coverage of the review, which seems to throw the entire youth gender treatment paradigm in this country into question, has been remarkably muted. But today's guest is never muted. Jesse Single, Jesse Single has been covering this topic and has taken a lot of heat for it for years in the pages of publications like The Atlantic, The Dispatch, and on his Substack, Single Minded. Jesse, thanks for joining us. Uh, thank you for having me. I have definitely been muted by many people, just to be clear. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so muted on uh, Twitter, muted, muted on Facebook, uh, everywhere you can mute Jesse, he has been mm -hmm. muted, but he never mutes himself. And I want to, uh, I gave some context in the opening there, Jesse, but just to start us off, since you're the one who's been keeping track of this for years, could you just tell us why you think the cast review should matter to American audiences? Yeah, well, so the short answer is in a perfect world it wouldn't have uh, because we've known for a while that a lot of the evidence we have for these treatments does not meet certain basic thresholds we should want for a medical intervention given to minors, uh, and we can go more into those details. Uh, the difference here is that while countries like Sweden and Finland have done these, these one-off, important but one-off uh, systematic reviews of the evidence, and come to the conclusion that the evidence is not there. This was a much more ambitious effort. Uh, it included uh, seven or eight systematic reviews on different subjects. It included interviews with parents and kids and clinicians and other stakeholders. It was the most ambitious effort into examining the basis for both youth gender medicine and the way it's delivered in the UK uh, ever. I mean, by I think by a wide margin. So. At this point, I think it is very hard to consider yourself pro-science, for lack of a better term, and to argue that we have good evidence for these treatments. Now, that leaves a lot of questions hanging out there, including what the what the rules should be. Um, and I, I think that bans on these treatments have elicited a huge and unhelpful backlash themselves. But uh, it seems like the answer should be somewhere between banning them and uh, assuming all is well and that we have good evidence for these treatments efficacy. If I were a reader of most you know, mainstream American publications, I wouldn't really know that the cast review even happened. Uh, can you talk about why that is? To me, this seems like kind of a massive oversight. And I know you've been calling a lot of attention to this. Yeah, I've been a little bit um, radicalized in recent years just about the state of mainstream progressive journalism. This won't come as news to anyone who, who's read or listened to my work, but 
this is is one of the more remarkable examples I've come across because in many cases, what outlets like CNN or NBC say about this subject is indistinguishable from what activist groups do uh, to the point where I wrote about this on my Substack. Someone tipped me off that in basically every CNN article on this subject, on the news side, these aren't opinion pieces. They have a stock copied and pasted sentence about I've the got efficacy. That slide right here, so we can all look at it. Uh, this is the CNN's kind of copy pasta definition of what is gender affirming care. Um, and yeah. It says gender affirming care is medically necessary evidence based care that uses a multidisciplinary approach to help a person transition from their assigned gender, the one that they were designated at birth, to their affirmed gender, the gender by which they want to be known. And, and as you've documented, this appears over and over and over again. The, some variation on this paragraph. Um, we I pulled together just like a little montage of like it appearing and article after article that I'll play as you tell us a little bit more about what you take away from the fact that this kind of copy pasta paragraph uh, is used. Yeah, I mean, I, I just think it's remarkable and it's quite irresponsible. And I mean, maybe you guys have seen something like this before. I certainly haven't. Like, it's not unusual to have a style guide. Um, if you're a writer it's useful to have like little bits of the process almost outsourced to your editors or your bosses. Like, should I use a legal immigrant or undocumented immigrant? There's often a style guide at a publication. Reason probably has one saying, this is what we use. We're not going to litigate this every time. To have a, say again, Oh, Liz, oh, I, I was, I was, I was just going to say, yeah. I mean, Reason, you know, mostly follows the Associated Press style guide, but we deviate from it in some important ways. Like when there was the big kerfuffle over whether or not black should be capitalized while white <laughs> remains lowercase. Yeah. Uh, we had a very. Well, this is back when I was an editor for Reason, as opposed to more writer. I was very much on the side of absolutely not. We are not going to adhere to this kind of nonsensical yeah. um, Associated Press role that very much, I think, um, just sort of <clears throat> aids in. Um, it, it sort of fans the flames of some of these racial grievance arguments in a way that I find unhelpful and distracting. Yeah. And yet that was the Associated Press dictate from on high. Um, and so we still to this day deviate from the AP in that way. But I know the AP also dictates that people use gender affirming care, which mm -hmm. is language that I sort of object to because it kind of gives away the argument, right? It acts as if it's a little bit of a foregone conclusion where like, you know, affirming, how could you, how could you disagree with something that affirms somebody? Right. Yeah, I mean, I think great distress, all... right? Like we all can see, I think many people concede people who are dealing with this are in great distress. And so of course you would want to affirm them. Of course you'd want to do a benevolent thing. Yeah. I mean, I think there've been a lot of those little examples of outlets just taking on activist language. Um, the CNN thing is just sort of different and, and more remarkable because you're just, you're outsourcing your thinking on this and saying this medically necessary and evidence-based both mean pretty particular things. And neither of those has been proven as the CAS report showed. Do you expect that there will be a pivot in these media outlets w uh, upon the publication of this and probably more importantly, the adoption by these national governments of some of its recommendations? Um, well, I mean, on the media side, I think there's a subset of really gonzo outlets that are sort of running hit pieces against the cast review. Um, and the cast mm -hmm. review isn't perfect. No scientific publication is, but it, it, it's quite solid. And it's also the case for its solidity increases when you note that it's just came to the same conclusion as everyone else. So it, it, it's strange to paint it in a nefarious light. I think the fact that CNN is ignoring it, um, and I think NBC is mostly ignoring it, all the major outlets are mostly ignoring it, other than the Times, which has been good on this, um, and the Atlantic, that's actually a good first step that they're not running hit pieces. Like it sort of suggests they're a little bit wary about coming mm -hmm. out on the activist side, which is in mm -hmm. itself uh, progress. On the other hand, they should obviously cover this because they provide blanket coverage to other aspects of the youth gender medicine fight. So why would you possibly not cover the most important scientific publication in the history of this controversy? It's a little bit baffling. I like that we're sort of like uh, clearly grading on a curve, right? Like the state of American mainstream media is so bad that the absence of awful articles on this is perceived as like a good thing. Um, I do want to sort of talk a little bit about the origin of the cast review to what degree does it start with um, the whole Tavistock controversy? Yeah, I mean, it, it largely comes down to the Tavistock controversy. I, I don't have a grasp on the sort of deep in the weeds, in and outs of it, but um, mm -hmm. Hannah explain, Barn... Explain what Tavistock was, you know, for yeah. people who haven't been following. Tavistock was basically where kids got youth gender medicine um, within the NHS system. There, there's 
sort of a main clinic in London and a couple others, um, but it's it's very centralized. And uh, the BBC, former BBC journalist Hannah Barnes wrote a book called Time to Think, uh, Inside the Collapse of the Tavistock Clinic, I think that's the subtitle. For years, there were concerns that the Tavistock Clinic, in part because it was so overwhelmed and these wait times were so long, was not delivering comprehensive care. There were complaints on both sides. Um, there was a activist group called Mermaids that is very pro-youth transition that was involved probably more than they should have been in terms of influencing the clinic. Um, How so? Well, basically, they were sometimes there in the room as sort of advocates for young patients. And I, I don't want to get too conspiratorial here because I asked Hannah Barnes about this. And she doesn't think Mermaids was like calling the shots. But anytime you have activism and journal mixing, uh, it's not good. And and there's a sense Mermaids had some influence on the way uh, the Tavistock Clinic did business. Now, it's not like every kid. First of all, there was a wait list. So it took a while for kids to be seen there. And it's definitely not the case that every kid who went there was immediately put on hormones. It's more that what Hannah Barnes and the cast of you found is just very inconsistent care. Um, mm. uh, Barnes referenced this idea of a cl uh, clinician roulette, where it's sort of a roll of the die or the roulette wheel, whether your kid will get a clinician who will actually examine the origins of their gender distress or one who's very enthusiastic about starting them on blockers or hormones. Um, so, there was also a, a detransition named Kira Bell uh, filed a lawsuit against the Tavistock saying she was fast tracked to a transition. She subsequently regretted um, that was also part of the motivation for the cast review. But it, yeah, basically all originated with the idea that this this one centralized youth gender clinic was was a mess and not operating well. The the high court ruling in that case uh, is documented in the cast review, and th this is how the cast review summarizes their ruling, which we should note was overturned in a court of appeals. Yeah. Um, but uh, the, what the high court determined is that the information that a child would need to understand to, to have the requisite competence to in relation to puberty blockers would be things like the fact that the vast majority of patients taking puberty blockers go on to cross-sex hormones, the relationship between taking cross-sex hormones and subsequent surgery, potential loss of fertility, effects on sexual function, the unknown physical consequences of taking puberty blockers, and uh, the fact that the evidence base for all of this treatment is as yet highly uncertain. And so, when it really is coming down to this issue of informed consent. Uh, and I mean, consent is something that is, I think, central to my libertarian politics. Uh, it's also central to medical care. Um, so could you talk a little bit about um, that aspect of, of the debate, the, the fact that the the court ruling really seems to be centered around that question. Yeah, I mean, so so over there they have this um, concept of I think Gillick competency, just centering on the question of um, you know when when minors can truly consent. Uh, the short answer in the states, at least, is minors can't consent to medical treatment except in certain outlined circumstances, or in Oregon, where remarkably fifteen year olds can consent to these treatments without any. Um, parental uh, approval, but usually they need parental approval. And the question, especially in the state, well, in, in both countries has been, what does it mean for a 14 year old to know that this thing they're taking might impact their sexual function? It might, this is highly contested, but it might literally impact the likelihood they will desist, meaning their gender dysphoria will go away on its own. Um, does a 14 year old really know what it means to not be able to have kids later on, given that the vast majority of people have kids? So there are all these questions that I don't think have been taken seriously by the media. Oh, go ahead. How could a four, yeah, it's interesting. Like this question of like, how could a 14 year old realistically rule on whether or not they're comfortable foregoing sexual pleasure when, you know, maybe they've literally never had sex, right? Like I've, yeah. There's all of these questions that like at the age of 14, you don't have a strong concept of what it is like to, um, you know, like possibly want these things later on. You don't have a very full understanding of what having kids or having a you know positive sex life actually means and what bearing that could have on your future happiness. One of the strangest things about this to me has been the glibness um, broadcast by a lot of adults about these questions. Like either we know the answer, they'll say, which we don't, or maybe like, don't worry about it. Um, I talked to a, like a really high ranking endocrinologist recently who 
is very much on the affirming side. And I asked him, well, if a parent came to you and said, my natal male child who's seeking to transition a female went on estrogen for two years and then decided to stop, would they still have like sexual function? Would they be able to use their penis for pleasure? And these are obviously icky things to talk about. I think that's how um, mm. why, where some of the glibness comes from. Who wants to talk about minors and sexual pleasure and stuff? This endocrinologist who is in as good a position as anybody to know the answer to that question said, we don't know. We hmm. don't know if going hmm. on estrogen for two years might just render you sort of incapable of like normal sexual pleasure if you're young. This is all very different if you go on hormones at a later age when you're already sexually developed. But um, that jumped out at me because that's an incredibly basic question to not have an answer to for, you know, for a parent or, or a kid who asks it. Well, there's an yeah. inherent tension here with puberty blockers in particular, which is like puberty blockers in order to effectively block puberty must be done before the onset of puberty or before puberty is completed. But at the same time, that's also precisely when, I mean, we're talking about kids around the age of 11, 12, 13, it's precisely before they can sort of meaningfully consent, right? And so what is the sort of ethical or appropriate thing to do? Because I imagine anybody who's not, you know, a total bigot asshole is coming at this from a perspective of like, you know, when people are grappling with these questions, they're in a state of severe distress. And yeah. so what is the means of alleviating that distress? But also there's a fundamental tension presented by puberty blockers. Um, how can a 12 year old meaningfully consent and understand what exactly it is that they're taking on? Yeah. And again, so much glibness. I mean, you'll see like high ranking doctors just make these bizarrely overgeneralized statements that, you know, trans kids know what they're doing. They know who they are. They, they know how to, they have high decision-making capacity. And I think in the case of a 15 year old who is highly intelligent and who has felt extremely gender dysphoric since they were three unabated, you can make a clear moral argument for that. That's very obviously not the case for there's this sort of rising cohorts of kids where the story, this is sort of a composite, but it's a 12 year old with autism and anxiety and they went on a social media binge during the pandemic and then they suddenly came out as trans i guess in this they'd be 14 if they went on the binge during the pandemic but um young kids who are very troubled who don't have the long history of gender dysphoria that used to be a requirement for this treatment when it was pioneered in the netherlands uh these are very different cases and, and they should not be approached with glibness yeah and those the the individual nature of those cases that you bring up, I think, is is really important to consider, and and that's why I'm, you know, resistant to kind of some of the bans that you mentioned at the beginning. We can talk a little bit more about that later, um, just because I think there's probably cases, especially among these older kids, where it may be better left to the kids, the parents, the doctors to figure this out. But the reality is we do need to get to the bottom of the scientific and medical questions for those people to be making sound decisions. And that's why I'm interested in, in this discussion, because, you know, I don't really, I, I pretty much favor medical freedom, body modification, limitless self-experimentation for adults. Uh, I don't really think the medical establishment even needs to be gatekeeping a lot of this stuff for adults. Um, and maybe trans people would be better off with some more distance from the medical establishment. But for kids, uh, there is a much higher bar and um, to you know permanently alter a kid's development and body and physiology, it requires a, a higher threshold. It requires some more compelling reasons um, and a, a real benefit shown. And the cast review seems to throw a lot of doubt uh, on that. Uh, we should probably dig into like a little bit more what exactly it's saying. Um, you know, first we should talk about this uh, rise in um, referrals to the clinic. So this graph shows uh, quite an increase from 2011 to 2020. Uh, the one in the report uh, has the years 2009 to 2016. And in both of these, what you really see is that top, that beige color at the top is adolescent females. That's where uh, the bulk of the growth has been. Um, that d doesn't seem like that was always the case. What is going on there, Jesse? Yeah, I mean, no one knows. It, traditionally, it was um, male adults who are more likely to seek to transition in like the early days, when, you know, 60s, 70s, when transgender medicine first became really established. Then when youth gender medicine became established, it was also more likely to be uh, natal males. And 
One explanation for that, which I, I think is somewhat true, is just that if you think of the threshold at which a parent will be like, my kid has a problem, let's take them to a gender clinic. I think girly boys were often treated more harshly or more pathologically than tomboys. Like tomboys are like cute and quirky and are seen as growing Thank out of you. it. That's so nice. <laughs> You're not a tomboy. You're I tom used to be. Oh, well, that's what I mean. See, you yeah. grew out of it. Um, not that there would have been anything wrong. My my partner, my podcast partner is very much a tomboy. Um, <laughs> Girly boys were like, were that was a real problem. They were treated for it. They were subjected to electric shocks and aversion therapy in the worst cases. Mm. In a way, I, I don't think gender nonconforming girls tended to be, although I'm sure there were exceptions. So that's what researchers and clinicians have noted is that the ratio has really flipped. And there's some cohort studies of kids at youth gender clinics, whereas that graph would suggest... 70% of them are natal females. Um, so there's two, two dueling explanations for the rise that aren't mutually incompatible. One is that as social norms have changed and trans people have gotten more accepted, kids are more comfortable coming out as trans and some of those kids then go to gender clinics. The other explanation is that there's a degree of social contagion going on where kids come to believe they're trans because of the internet or their culture or their friends. It's anecdotal evidence, but there are so many anecdotal accounts of a cluster of friends all coming out as trans at the same time that not all going to gender clinics, mind you, but coming out as trans that, I mean, that seems to be part of it, but, um, well, I, but, but, but to the critics of that, um, view, you know, I saw somebody referencing this chart and saying, if you look starting around 2017, you see that it plateaus. And so therefore that proves that really this was a kind of pent up demand. And once people had access to the treatments, it's not going up indefinitely. It's like, we're now reaching the optimal level of like these, this is the number of people every year who are gonna seek treatment. What do you make of that argument? I don't think we know yet. Um, I, I also, I believe around the time of the pandemic, there was an artificial drop uh, at the Tavistock just because it was the pandemic. I think that's mentioned in the cast report. Um, mm -hmm. We don't know what's going to happen after the plateau. If the plateau subsequently drops, that would support the social hypothesis because it's like a lot of people realize they didn't actually want these treatments. If it goes back up, that would support something else that continues. Maybe it would support that view. I think people, there's been a tendency on all sides to take this, this graph. We only have a little chunk of it. Um, and then make extrapolations from it when I, I just, I don't think we know, to be honest, because we don't, we don't know what the sort of, quote unquote, natural number of gender dysphoric youth is like, we, we don't know. Well, part of what we would really need is long term data on the outcomes of these 12 year olds, like the 12 year old in, you know, 2018, 10 years later, what do they end up identifying as, um, especially as their friend, their life has changed and their, their location has changed and their friend group has changed, but we just sort of don't have this. Is that sort of data being collected? on mass or not so no, much? No, I mean, there's like, there's one of the big issues with the cast report is, um, this will shock you, but it turns out the NHS is a little bit of a bureaucratic mess and they basically- Long wait times in a bureaucratic yeah, mess? Yeah, Socialized healthcare, what? I shouldn't, I'm even, I, I'm pro that kind of healthcare. So I'm giving yeah. you people ammunition. Well, you're but, baiting um, us. I'm baiting you, exactly. Those commies over there, um, <laughs> they had a problem where and I find this sort of bizarre because one of the benefits of that sort of system is good record keeping. Like the reason Sweden has produced some of the best research on outcomes of trans adults is they do have centralized record keeping. Um, but I'll concede so the that Tavistock on your side. I do think they do a good job of that. Yeah. Um, so the Tavistock Clinic and the NHS system, we could have much better data, but they just seem to sort of lose track of kids as they move from youth to adult care. There's mm -hmm. also been like clear attempts to hide some data and not cooperate with the investigators, all of which is inexcusable because uh, youth gender medicines technically came online 2008-ish. It really, uh, you know, look at the curve. That was really in the 2010s. But we're, we're like up 15-ish years into this being fairly common treatment. We have effectively no data. And, and also like data from the UK wouldn't necessarily apply to the US. And in the US, the lack of good data is astonishing. And that includes like big a big federally funded project that just isn't delivering useful data. I it, it, in the report on it, well, oh, yeah, go ahead, go ahead Liz. Oh, well, okay. I was going to say know. in the report there, there's um when they talk about deep transition, they it partially bolsters your point. They, she says that um, regrets or detransition are hard to determine from GDC clinic data alone because 
those who detransition may not choose to return to the gender clinic and are hence lost to follow up. Um, she cites a study of 68 patients, um, which is a very small sample. And um, of the 41 who were started on hormones, eight or 20% chose to stop after five years. Uh, and then there's another study that's cited near the end uh, that's a much bigger uh, audit of 3,006 patients and found fewer than 10 of them detransitioned. And so that's another thing that I have heard from trans activists is that detransition rates, as far as we know, are fairly low. Um, but I guess what you're saying is that that's possibly just due to terrible data collection. Yeah, I, I just we don't we don't know what the detransition rate is. Do you? I could pull it up if not. Do you have a slide of that figure you just gave the point five? I don't have that slide on me right now. No. This is an important uh, point that's been very viral online. So I do want to um see if I can find this real quick because I believe um it stems from this is very good audio. <laughs> so if memory like serves, the breathing sounds. Are you kidding? They're like, exactly. oh my god, I get to hear Jesse single. As, <gasps> <Asmer>. um, <laughs> this I believe was a group of kids who were not. First of all, were not referred to endocrinology. So mm -hmm. that right away tells you it's not like the group we care about. The group that did seek medical treatment. Um, also, this was a group with a huge loss to follow up rate. Like they were not, uh, they were not tracked. And the 0.5% only refers to young people who announced they detransitioned. Oh uh, yeah, I have it here. It's 13.13. So the audit yep. report sets out that 73% of the audited patients were not referred to endocrinology. Uh, of those, 0.5% detransitioned. So I don't, I don't know what to make of that between the loss to follow up and the fact that these weren't kids who appeared headed toward medicalization anyway. I think it's telling that people are pulling out that stat rather than the 20% one, which you should also take with a grain of salt. On the other, other hand, there was a study of um, uh, within the military health system, they have better record keeping in this country. And there was one study where I think five years in something like 20% of adults had stopped their hormones. So that you know, wow. Huge difference between almost 1% and 20 yeah. And then the thing that's even harder to capture, which Cass brings up, is that uh, you'll never know the child or the teen who started on um, the, down this medicalized path and then never experienced adulthood as their birth gender. Yeah. We don't know like the alternative. If they had not gone through that treatment, would they have then experienced life as an adult male or adult female and been like, oh, this isn't as bad as be like going through puberty? So yeah. that question I think is even harder to capture. And I don't know how you would. The the brutal trade-off here is it, it's definitely true, especially for natal males, that if you go through puberty, it'll be much harder for you to pass and it'll require more surgery. Like if you do decide right. to live your adult life as a woman it's much harder to pass. But on the other hand, puberty is like exactly when a lot of sort of more advanced forms of abstract thinking kick in cognitively. And you're in some cases you might be puberty blockers might cut off exactly the sort of cognitive development that could help you gain a better understanding of your gender that might lead you to not need medical transition, whatever you identify as. So it's a really difficult discuss it um, trade off for the families and the kids involved. Well, so I want to linger on the social contagion concept for a second, because I think that this, there's a lot of doubt out there that it's legit. And I'm curious about whether you can almost, Jesse, give an overview of the sort of best case, best argument on both sides, right? Like the best argument I've heard of against the social contagion theory is, you know, the sense that there is pent up demand because for so long being trans and, you know, gender transitions have been so heavily stigmatized in many more conservative places. It has been very hard for children to come out. I mean, imagine Footloose Town, um, at least in the United States, right? Like this has just been extremely taboo for a long time. So there's a sense as, as it becomes less stigmatized, you know, more and more children and families can really actively, you know, live out life as their true selves. But then the other other side of the social contagion thing, at least based off of you know people I know and things that I've heard, it really does seem like it occurs in these clusters. It's like the subculture thing. It's a way of getting purchase and clout sometimes within these subcultures, which would not be shocking to me having formerly been a 13-year-old girl, right? Like yeah. there's a little bit of this herd mentality. How do you look at the evidence on both sides of the equation and where do you ultimately sort of come out? And how would we even go about studying whether this is valid? You you 
you can't really i mean the way you could study it is you could find some of these alleged clusters and just follow them over five or ten years but science is hard and no one's doing yeah. that um, and i i think there would be outrage to even try to do that frankly because there's been as far as I can tell, a fair amount of suppression of like scientific efforts to better understand this stuff. People should just Google Lisa Littman, see what happened to her. She came up with this theory of rapid onset gender dysphoria. So it's hard for me, a couple things here. I call myself a pervert for nuance on my podcast. We even have t-shirts that no one buys. Um, I think a lot of times you need to break down questions like this into their constituent questions. So, um, okay. If, uh, it, are kids socially influenced by their peers in other areas? Obviously the answer is yes. And I think if the claim from the folks who are against this theory, who in my experience won't really engage with their opponents is that no kids think they're trans because of social influence. I mean, that's obviously not true. Yeah. I think mm -hmm. zero I, that that I mean, what, what identity is adopted by 0% of adolescents through peer pressure? Yeah. Um, I'm just going to pull up the uh, the uh, sort of generational breakdown as well, because it might be pertinent to this conversation. This sure. is from the cast review showing that there's a huge spike among Gen yeah. Zers identifying. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. Again, I don't that probably doesn't answer the question because it still could be just because of social acceptance. But that difference is pretty striking to observe. I like well, that the Gen X ladies are probably like by and large the most like lesbian identifying and they're like, nah, <laughs> tipping right. trans. Um, the problem is this data is like pretty useless. This is the other thing. When you mm. say kids are influenced mm. to identifying by trans, um, by their peers, identifying as trans these days means a lot of things. It doesn't mean mm. you have gender dysphoria necessarily. There's a subset of people who, who look like me and present like me and have no plans on medically transitioning who identify as non-binary in a case that like seems to be more, in some cases they'll say explicitly it's political. They don't, they reject the idea of these gender roles. I, I find mm. that regressive, the purely political, like I think we should expand the boxes rather than create more, but setting that aside, if a 14 year old comes out as trans because they don't like being put into a gender box, that's pretty different from a 14 year old coming out as trans and saying, I can't live with my body. And mm. a lot of the social contagion talk sort of conflates the two. Um, my short answer is I've never, I, I want to steal man both sides. I've never heard a, remotely credible argument as to why social influence couldn't be part of this. And that's especially true when you realize that in some places and contexts, look, you would not want to be a visibly trans person walking down the street in like the road in rural Mississippi. It's obviously true that this gives you some degree of capital and community in more liberal settings and especially online, which is where kids live a lot of their lives. So you'll often hear activists say things like, why would anyone want to identify as trans? Trans people are oppressed. LGBT people are oppressed. That's obviously true in a global sense, but that doesn't mean that identifying as trans doesn't have certain benefits. It's like saying, why would anyone want to identify as a goth? Everyone makes fun of goths. And I'm not making that that direct comparison. Yeah. But like, there's a lot of but, things people identify as in adolescence, right. despite those being marginalized groups. Hmm. Yeah, and this does over it does seemingly overlap uh, with Jonathan Haidt's thesis, which Reason has engaged a lot uh, about the move of teenage dumb and childhood from offline to online. And you see that same gender gap that you see in transitioning where you see kind of a disproportionate effect on young females, uh, natal females. Um, so that's perhaps more evidence to, to be investigated or to, you know, bolster that hypothesis. Um, we should, uh, I want to look at some of uh, Cass's conclusions about the science. Um, what she says is that results from five uncontrolled observational studies suggested that um, gender affirming hormones are likely to improve symptoms of gender dysphoria um, it may also improve depression, anxiety, quality of life, uh, suicidality, and psychosocial functioning. Um, and this is the kind of the theme of her uh, entire review, uh, this next paragraph where she says, most studies included in this review did not report comorbidities and no study reported concurrent treatments in detail. So in other words, um, 
the the there's been a there have been a lot of studies of this, but they don't separate things like what else is going on psychologically with this person, or are they in counseling at the same time that they're receiving these treatments? So is it the counseling or is it the medication that's making them feel better? Um, how, how did we get here? How did we get to uh, the point where the 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 strength of the evidence base is so confounded with all these factors? Yeah, I, I, you said there are a lot of studies. There there aren't a lot of studies. I just um, there aren't. Um, how did we get here? There's incredibly low standards in academic publishing. I mean, this has really blackpilled me on the idea of peer review at this point, just because something is peer reviewed, at least in the fields I'm familiar with. I have no more reason to trust that than a well-written takedown on the Substack, frankly. Like, uh, frankly, it's so bad. So hmm. um, we can focus on one study I know the most about, uh, Chen et al. It's a New England Journal of Medicine study. It's the biggest study yet published on youth gender medicine in the States, I believe. Big federally funded project. They did a thing called a pre-registration where you announce your research protocol, what you're going to study, how you're going to study. This is a way of sort of setting up guardrails so you can't like cherry pick basically. Um, and then they went ahead and just cherry picked completely. This is in the New England Journal of Medicine. So they said they were going to look at eight variables uh, for psychosocial outcomes for kids who go on hormones. Six of those variables disappear with no explanation in the final study. And it strikes me that if they had found what they wanted to find, and these are all gender affirming clinicians with, with skin in the game, why wouldn't they have reported that? Um, so it's like a pretty big violation of why you pre-register in the first place. And it was just allowed to happen. On top of that, this is a group of about 300 kids uh, in this cohort who are pre-screened for serious suicidality. Two years later, two of those kids were dead. They had killed themselves while undergoing these treatments. That's just sort of swept under the rug, which I consider a red flag. Two out of 300 over two years is a high rate of suicide for adolescents who thankfully don't kill themselves nearly as much as they engage in suicidal ideation or non-suicidal self-harm. Um, finally, as the cast of you notes, these kids at the same time, the ones with the most severe mental problems were also getting counseling and medication. This isn't a small issue. This is like almost the whole thing. Yeah. If you notice a modest increase in a kid's mental health over two years, and many of these increases were quite modest, even if they were statistically significant, how do you know that's because of the hormones rather than medication, which often works, or therapy, which often works? Uh, I shouldn't say often, but for some people, those interventions work. Without controlling for those confounding factors, you don't know. You don't know full stop. There's no shortcut here. And this was also a problem in the Dutch research that sort of underpins all of youth gender medicine basically so no one has done studies that can add, like really answer these questions and that's a huge problem and I, I think it's frustrating because this is taxpayer funded federally funded nih endorsed research that can't really tell us anything um and involves a fair amount of hiding of data and one, one that really stood out to me from this review was this look at puberty blockers uh which we should talk about in more detail because that's where a lot of the policy action has come into play but um this is comparing a study from amsterdam of puberty blockers and a study uh in london for pu puberty blockers and so uh the ones the dark line here is amsterdam uh and when it's going in that direction uh that means that it they saw improvement in psychological functions. So in the Amsterdam study, they kind of saw all this improvement. And then in the London study, it's all, uh, you know, slightly negative. Uh, so I, it's yeah, concerning to, <laughs> to see it. that kind of, dis, Replication that kind of discrepancy uh, on an issue like this. Yeah. Yeah. What accounts for that? Do we have any uh, idea? I don't know. I mean, this was this was weird because this was a failed replication where they uh, on the part of the Tavistock. They're trying to replicate mm -hmm. what the Dutch found, which was some improvement with puberty blockers. And again, I, I, we should put improvement in air quotes because these these studies mm -hmm. could they were missing. There was missing data, not in a nefarious way, just kids who didn't fill out certain items. They didn't control for confounds. I don't. I one of my mistakes as a journalist was treating the Dutch research as stronger than it was back in the well, day. That was kind of like the the gold standard, right? The du yeah, what they call the Dutch protocol. Like that's what people were following. Yeah, yes. and, and what is that exactly? Sure, the Dutch protocol. Um, these were the first. Uh, this was the first team to really prescribe. The idea was for kids who are very gender dysphoric from a young age and always have been, and they have parental support, and they have a lack of other mental health problems. For this very 
carefully in theory selected cohort of kids. We'll put them on blockers. Although the Dutch didn't start blockers till a significantly later age than we're doing now, which I think is an important distinction. Um, mm. The blockers will give them time to think and make sure this is what they want to do. Then they'll go on hormones. Then they'll get surgery. Uh, the results of the Dutch, even if they were good, like uh, even if these were studies were better than they are, they wouldn't necessarily apply to kids who don't meet those criteria of having been gender dysfunction since childhood, supportive families, no other mental health problems. Basically, every aspect, every one of those criteria are being violated uh, in some American clinics. So the Brits tried to replicate that in the Tavistock uh, or in JIDS, as it's called. Um, there's a lot of like names here that I'm inevitably going to mix up. The Gender Identity Development Services, Tavistock, the Tavistock and Portman Trust. This is all the same system, these different terms. Um, they tried to replicate the Dutch results for puberty blockers. The results did not come back good. They, As you saw, no improvement, some, some um, worsening. Uh, actually, yeah, some worsening, mostly just no improvement. Um, yep. They basically hid those results. And at the same time they hid those results... They expanded their puberty blocker hormone. But they hit the results. Like what do you Yeah, mean? there was they literally a court order or? to release the full results. They were supposed to release the full results and they didn't. Um, oh. so it took years for us to know. There's details about this in Hannah Barnes's book. Um hmm. so at the same time as they failed to replicate the results, they expand the cohort of kids they give blockers to, which is just strange and not good. You could make an argument that. If the idea is puberty will wreak havoc on a young trans kids or gender dysphoric kids psyche, you can make an argument that just keeping them stable um, is good enough while they decide whether to go on blockers. But that's not really the argument people have been making. People have been making the argument that these treatments improve mental health. And if that's not the case, it's much it's more difficult and complicated to make the argument for them, given the unknowns and potential side effects. So I follow Hannah Barnes um, quite closely. I find her to be uh, really sort of even keeled in the face of a lot of craziness. Um, the thing that I just keep coming back to with all of this, and it almost sounds so stupidly obvious, is like there appears to be massive medical malfeasance going on that seems spurred along by an entire activist class and then honestly significant portions of the media, um, at least in the United States. Like what accounts for this almost like mass burying of one's head in the sand, um, trying to ignore the data. Like, it seems like, like the m best possible take, which I think is the, the one that you tend to gravitate toward Jesse is, Hey, look, we have insufficient evidence to prove a lot of these things. It is hard for us to say what the effect is exactly. Uh, we frankly need better, more and better data in order to be able to come to more definitive conclusions because of how new many of these interventions are and how new this field is. And so we shouldn't make ultra strong claims one direction or the other because this is very high stakes and we simply just don't quite have quality data to the degree that we need to. And yet somehow there's like this suppression of data. There's this bearing of the evidence that does emerge. And then there's an awful lot of like, it, it seems as though we're sort of throwing caution to the wind more broadly on something as high stakes as youth gender transitions. Why, like, is this, am I properly characterizing this dynamic and how did we get to this place? I know that's kind of the massive, like, you know, million dollar question, but like, yeah. I feel like I feel a little bit crazy because I'm not, you know, particularly animated about, you know, trying to prevent legitimately trans identifying legitimately distressed kids from having medical interventions that can help alleviate their problems. But at the same time, I kind of look at all of this and I just feel um, really, really, really concerned about how we got to this place. Yeah. I mean, I think there's an argument that malfeasance is too strong a term. I, I think, unfortunately, a lot of doctors really think they're doing the right thing and just haven't. Mm -hmm. I, one thing that's really shocked me about this is like, I, I'm not a methods expert. I'm not a mm -hmm. quant head. I often need help from experts for like, you know, more high level questions. But, you know, on a scale of one to 10, I'm a three or a four. I know how to read a paper and just like make basic critiques of it. You see a lot of doctors that apparently, the, the doctors who have to make decisions about whether to prescribe these treatments not really being familiar with the literature and just taking it on faith that these papers say what, you know, the abstract says they say. So partly mm. it's just people genuinely trying to do the right thing. This has also become a bit of a moral crusade and mm. trans kids are extremely vulnerable. Gender non-conforming kids have always been treated poorly. And, you know, 
because they're a um, genuinely sympathetic group, this has really become a focus on the left. And oftentimes you get these profiles or congressional testimony from these like media savvy trans kids who really seem to have benefited from transition. And it's just very hard to raise any questions about that. Cause it's like, why would you want to hurt these kids on top of all that? There's been the spreading of a lot of scary misinformation suggesting that we know that kids will are much more likely to kill themselves if they don't get these treatments. It's and, the would you rather have an alive son or a dead daughter type yeah. argument. And I've actually, talked to parents who have been given yeah. a version of that, which is outrageous. We we do not have nearly enough data, um, A, to know that these treatments really alleviate suicidality. Uh, we have some data that they don't. Um, I, I don't know how any responsible clinician or researcher could make that claim. Uh, we don't know. But obviously, who wants to be the guy who's like, well, actually, the suicide, not like, <clears throat> it's not a fun position to be in. Um, and then on top of all of that, Trump and uh, Trump made everything more heated, of course. And then when Republicans, I pointed this out in my piece in the dispatch. It's one thing to have this argument over whether what the assessment process should be and what gender clinics should look like. It's another thing to have the argument over whether they should exist. So a lot of parents, especially stuff, uh, those stuff in the stuffed, especially those stuck in the sort of these unfortunately spreading left wing uh, misinformation ecosystem swamplands are freaking out. And you can understand why, because they have trans kids. They think their kids could kill themselves if they don't get these treatments. And now their gender clinic or the gender clinic they might go to in a few years risk being shut down. So th that really threw fuel on everything. And I'm not going to pretend this was like a sane or non-toxic discussion before the Republicans like really started pushing these laws, but it has made everything much worse. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, as a parent, you, you, you know, it, it's hard for me to, to uh, hold any of these parent, you know, I, I just can't imagine being in that situation. My, my kids are, are very young, but just being confronted with a doctor and all these people saying that if you don't follow this path, then your kid might kill himself and it'll be on blood will be on your hands. That's just, uh, you know, uh, the, the choice you're making under those conditions is, you know, that's, that's, it's, it's horrible to, to contemplate. And, um, you know, that, that, that is why, coming up with some, you know, evidence-based guidelines, regardless of how we feel about legislation, um, having the evidence base and like something for parents uh, and and gender non-conforming kids to actually draw on is like really crucial. And I think it's, it's worth, uh, before we go uh, talk about the backlash some more, just talk about what the recommendations of the CAST review actually are and how they... Um, what, like what changes they're suggesting from the status quo. Um, this is their outline of the medical pathway at the start of the review. So there would be assessment. Um, is this person in need of medical intervention? Then puberty blockers, uh, and it says Tanner 2 plus, and that's essentially with the saying, once the signs of the onset of puberty have manifested, then you can begin puberty blockers, um, testosterone or estrogen at age 16 and up, surgery at age 18 and up. Um, what Cass says in her conclusion is that in considering endocrine interventions, so that's hormones and puberty blockers, there's this large number of unknowns um, regarding risks and benefits, a lack of robust information to help them make decisions. And that presents a major problem in obtaining informed consent. Um, we've mentioned already that puberty blockers are, they're putting a hold on that. Um, hormones was a little more vague as far as I could tell, but maybe you can explain that more. Here in recommendation H, she says, masculinizing and feminizing hormones from age 16 is available, but the review would recommend extreme caution. Um, so what what are bottom line summarized changes from the status quo um, in England? And also, how does it differ from what's going on here in the United States? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know exactly how uh, the Casper rule will be sort of codified into NHS practice, but the language yeah. she's using is just really different. I mean, it's tended to be something like, you know, for well-assessed kids with well-assessed often not really being defined. Um, 
puberty blockers and hormones are helpful. Here, she's really sort of putting the onus on on evidence that they will be helpful. Uh, so extreme caution is that that was the language, right? Extreme caution. Yes. Yeah. I mean, that's yeah. that's it's um, somewhat vague, but. Uh, extreme caution, and there should be a clear clinical rationale for providing hormones rather than yeah. waiting until an individual reaches 18. Th this gives clinicians a lot of leeway to say, look, I'm just not sure about this. I think you should wait till you're an adult, which in an environment where you might be accused of like being pro-adolescent suicide for saying that could be mm. helpful. Um, as for the answer to how this differs from what's going on in the US, that's easy because we don't have any binding standards other than basic state laws about uh, age of medical consent. You can basically do whatever you want uh, because we don't have a centralized health authority that sort of makes the rules. Obviously, if you're in a Republican state that's passed one of these laws, that changes things. So we, we got to see how those will wend their way through the courts. Right. But uh, clinicians generally follow some sort of guideline. So what are they following um, when they're making these decisions in the United States? It's complicated because, first of all, they don't necessarily follow those guidelines. In theory, they're following the World Professional Association for Transgender Health's guidelines, the Endocrine Society's guidelines, the American Academy of Pediatrics. Uh, the CAS review also looked at these guidelines, which was incredibly useful. One of the systematic reviews was on the quality of these guidelines. Unfortunately, the guidelines also suck. The research sucks. The mm -hmm. guidelines suck. Everything sucks. Um, so they basically found that like the WPATH standards of care, which is the Bible of this stuff, made claims that are not backed up by the evidence, sometimes use citations that didn't match the claims in text. And within WPATH, which is the most influential uh, group on this stuff, there's a real battle going on. Um, this was captured in Emily Bazelon's excellent New York Times Magazine article between more cautious, careful clinicians and activists and activist mm. clinicians. So right after the WPATH Standards of Care 8 was published, within like a day or two, they pulled them offline, put them back online with no age restrictions at all, claiming it was a correction when it obviously came due to activist pressure. So the, the standards of care also has a whole chapter on eunuchs or people who don't want to have any genitalia, which is just not my understanding of mainstream transgender medicine. It's unclear why that exists. So I, I think like that everything old is new again, right? Like Unix used to be a thing way back yeah, many, we're you know, going medieval. Ago, and yeah, now we're, we're bringing medieval. it back a little bit. So, yeah, I think this puts clinicians in a dangerous position where they're flying blind. The endocrine society's guidelines are not considered good. And this all gets really in the weeds and somewhat subjective, but um, medical research methods experts do have ways of evaluating guidelines, and they do not think these guidelines are up to snuff. Um, what, one interesting subplot here is the American Academy of Pediatrics, which um, in 2018 produced these review, this policy statement that was not good and not scientific mm. lead author by a guy named Jason Rafferty, who is now being sued by a detransitioner who says that he rushed her into care. The AAP uh, both said they stand by the, those guidelines and that they're conducting their own systematic review. If their systematic review comes to the same conclusion as everyone else, it will not be possible for them to still point people to the 2018 guidelines because the 2018 guidelines were very bullish on youth gender medicine. Yeah. So. yeah. Unfortunately, I lost a lot of uh, trust in the AAP during COVID when they deleted their, um, uh, during the, the mask wars, the mask debates, masking children, they um, kind of stealth deleted a lot of uh, literature or statements they had about the importance of uh, seeing faces for child development to kind of justify their stance on masks. So that kind of unmasked something uh, in them. This is a me. broader problem. Like in, yeah. it's just the collapse of expert authority is so bad, especially, I mean, the two things contribute to one another, but the, the sort of rise or explosive rise of like Alex Jones types and all sorts of Alex right. Jones imitators at the same time, a lot of these public institutions are showing they're not trustworthy, I think is disastrous. And I, I don't, I don't know where a parent can honestly go to find good answers to these questions other than like, you know, read Emily Bazelon's article, but that's, it's not good that I, I mean, can't like, I mean, do you think any of these, do you think any of these organizations, these medical organizations will be able to pivot if the evidence 
that the cast review seems to be demanding comes forth and is kind of undermining their positions. Yeah, they'll have to eventually. Um, it'll yeah. be much harder in the States because we're so polarized and anything you say questioning the evidence is taken as an attack on trans kids or as support for these laws. But an organization like the AAP, if it's 2035, 10 years from now or whatever, and they have guidelines that run counter to the rest of the developed world that that's not going to work forever and so I, in my view not being privy to any of their internal deliberations at some point this is going to force a choice where either they have a few unpleasant days we're glad and the other activist groups get mad at them and denounce them or where they're just no one can take them seriously as an authority on anything like i think that's how stark the choices and i think they'll they'll deal with you know glad being mad at them for a little while yeah I think I misstated one thing about the puberty blockers, which is that they will be available um, on a clinical trial basis. Research, so yeah. It's, yeah, research basis. So if you, you know, opt in to say, I'm going to be the guinea pig for this trial, then you can do it, which seems about right, because at least you're getting some information, you're getting some signal that this is not some sort of like settled treatment and you're I mean, definitely... Taking that would have been a super cool thing to do, policy to adopt in maybe 2010. Uh, it's right. unfortunate it took this long. Are there um, any states? That, are there any states ahead. that are like getting it right uh, in terms of the guidance that they're providing clinicians with, and the sort of you know appropriately cautious? I mean, one thing that was coming to mind as Zach was talking earlier was and talking very empathetically about how the stakes must feel so high for parents who have gender questioning children is one thing that I kept thinking is, yes, I totally agree with all of that. But also I can't, you know, I'm a parent, I have a young child. I cannot imagine a situation where I put him, uh, you know, on something called a puberty blocker without having a fuller sense of what the possible range of outcomes might be and how that would affect his development. Yeah. Um, it's kind of like you're you're very damned if you do, damned if you don't. And I can't imagine feeling comfortable with giving him a drug where I'm not totally sure um, realistic what the realistic range of outcomes might be uh, and what possible negative effects might have. Are there any groups or states or like entities that are guiding people sort of appropriately with you know caution without having um, all of these really politically toxic components. Present. Yeah. So I have to admit that I, so I'm working on a book about this and given the lead time for writing a book, I haven't, I've actually not looked closely at all the state laws because I have no idea how they're going to end up in the courts. Like I just mm -hmm. don't. And it's going to be, a, I, I just, I'm not as up on them as I should be. I do know that in Florida, they actually commissioned a systematic review from McMaster University. Uh, McMaster is considered a leader in systematic reviews. Now, because it has what activists see as the DeSantis taint, people don't take that systematic review seriously. I would much prefer uh, the federal government to commission a systematic review of the evidence, which of course they could. It's unfortunate that we have to rely on a red state that does have a political agenda. I mean, not that the federal government doesn't uh, to provide that review, but they did. They commissioned an independent systematic review and you will never guess what it found. The same thing as everyone else. So Florida, to its credit, I mean, that that is actually advancing the conversation. Now, a group of activist clinicians, unfortunately, immediately. Oh, go ahead, Liz. I like that this is going to be taken as like, I'm sure there will be a tweet from some one of your critics that emerges from this. It's like, Jesse Single, uh, you know, <laughs> affirms that Florida is doing it the right way with regard to trans well, use, right? Like that's yeah, the- right. I agree of everything DeSantis that. has ever done. No, I mean, I think the restrictions, the restrictions are too hard. When you said the DeSantis hard. taint, I could, my gutter mind. Oh no. <laughs> yeah, well, as, some, as someone who's very familiar with DeSantis's taint uh, being here in Florida, uh, you know, which various uh, LGBT groups have ID'd as the worst state for yeah. trans people. I think because in addition to banning puberty blockers and hormones for kids, there's a bathroom bill making it so like trans people can't use the bathroom that matches their gender. Restrictions on adults building. Too, getting care. Uh, and adults yeah, I definitely care. think that's wrong. Uh, we should respect the rights of adults to decide for themselves which bathroom to use and just show kindness and decency. To oh, trans just, people. just to be clear to, to Twitter, yeah. which I know will always uh, take everything I say with charity and grace. I was not <laughs> endorsing their overall approach or any red <laughs> state. Course. I think all the laws I'm aware of are too restrictive. The difference is I do at least appreciate that they commissioned an independent systematic review. Now, I actually, yeah, I tried to FOIA for some details about that because I'm curious, for example, let's say this, it, you don't want it done by a state like Florida, because like, let's say the review had come back differently. Would they have published it? Were they under any obligation to publish it? We don't know that. But it's also like, 
how many systematic reviews do you need that all find the same thing? And I, I do credit them for commissioning right. one. Like that's a better way to do it than to just have lawmakers unfamiliar with the evidence overreaching, although I think they are also overreaching. I want to talk a little bit about the backlash and the reaction to the cast review. Um, there was this article uh, in the Times of London where Hillary Cass said that she can't travel on public transport after that gender report. Um, she'd been, or rather, she'd been told not to travel on public transport, I assume, because of some uh, threats that had come in. Um, mm -hmm. It mentions this figure, uh, Labor MP Don Butler who had made claims that she hadn't included a hundred of the uh, transgender studies contradicting her findings in it. She actually backtracked from that. I've got a clip of her backtracking that I want to run and then just talk to you a little bit about kind of the, the bevy of criticisms that have come in and what your responses to them are, Jesse. But uh, Ian, could you run the clip of Don Butler? Mr. Speaker, last week on the 15th of April, I said that all trans children and young people deserve access to high quality and timely health care and support um, and around 100 studies had not been included in the CAS report and we needed to know why. Mr. Speaker, by quoting this briefing, it seems though I may have mis um, inadvertently misled the House. Having spent the weekend speaking to Dr. Kaz, for which I'm very grateful for her time, she's made it clear uh, not just to me, but to a number of um, valuable clarifications on the radio and the media to trans and LGBT plus communities that all reports were included and both high and moderate, but both high and moderate quality research were considered as part of the evidence review. Mr. Speaker, I was also concerned about the advice Ms. Dr. Kaz was given about her safety and was shocked that some people implied that I was partly responsible for Dr. I'm really bothered. It's meant to be just a quick correction and not opening up the debate. You're absolutely, can I say how grateful I am for being honest and correct in the record. And you've absolutely done that and made it very clear that you were correct in it. I've got others to come in. I've got to move on. We cannot open the debate. The clerks are getting very worried. How uh, cute are they? How cute uh, they are is the adorable. Adorable. system of Real. government? This is yeah. Sora generated, like obviously. Parliament is awesome. I love Parliament. We would wow. never see an apology like that uh, in the U.S. Congress. And um, I don't know if that's because she's sincere or there's like the libel laws hanging over her head. But <laughs> yeah. um, it's uh, kind of refreshing to, to see that kind of thing. Um, yeah. But uh, can you speak at all to the substance of what's going on there with this debate over studies that she excluded from the report? Yeah. So the short version is any piece of writing of any sort that gains prominence that questions these treatments is going to be picked apart. Um, and I think two of the major vectors of a lot of rumors about this were Alejandra Caraballo. She's a Harvard law instructor and an activist, most famous in my mind. Uh, she, was, she was invited to uh, testify before Congress about online harassment and online violence and then a Republican member of Congress had printed out one of her own tweets saying that members of the Supreme Court should never enjoy a day of peace in their life after the abortion ruling. It was like, huh, that seems to be pretty inflammatory. Mm -hmm. Carabayo has tweeted, has a big audience, has tweeted a lot of false stuff about this, as has Aaron Reed, another well-known activist. Unfortunately, they're both seen as like big debunking types. Um, they're not. They constantly spread misinformation about youth gender medicine. And they spread, they and many others, I should say. First spread the rumor that basically the cast review excluded all studies that aren't randomized controlled trials. Um, there are no real RCTs of youth gender medicine. So that would mean they excluded like all the studies. That was bizarre because that is plainly false. Like that's just not what happened. Um, then there were like claims that 98% of studies of youth gender medicine were tossed out. That's false. I think there might have been some confusion because when you do a systematic review, first you enter search terms and you get a ton of results. And then always you call them down to the ones most applicable to what like what you're looking for. I think that's where 98% came from. It's totally false. Um, so basically they were accused of cherry picking and throwing out a lot of good studies that would support the evidence of youth gender for youth gender medicine. That's just not true because those studies don't exist. Um, yesterday I saw another critique, which is uh, 
that this is like two in the weeds. It feels silly to respond to, but basically the pre-registration for the cast review systematic reviews says it was going to use one scale to um, uh, evaluate the quality of the studies. They ended up using that scale a little, but also this other scale not mentioned in the pre-registration in theory. I mean, as I just said, with the new England journal of medicine, you shouldn't deviate from your pre-registration, but this is like, a misdemeanor at most, it would not change the overall outcome. Because again, we know from all these other systematic reviews, there's no good study. So I, I'm coming from a biased place myself. Everyone has bias. I have not found this to be good faith. And in many cases, the people making certain methodological critiques of the cast review will completely ignore those critiques in other contexts. So Jack Turbin is a prominent psychiatrist who's very pro-gender, use gender medicine. He has a book coming out about it. He was raising the alarm bells about the pre-registration uh, issue in this context. Um, and tell me if I'm too in the weeds here, but he's he's done expert declarations for lawsuits where he said the New England Journal of Medicine that has massive pre-registration issues provides good evidence for these treatments. So you can't have it both ways. Like either these pre deviations from pre-registration matter or they don't. And what people are doing is they're looking at the results of a study or a research effort, seeing whether or not they like the results and then deciding what standards will apply, which is not good science. And then were you surprised about the comments that Cass made about being afraid to ride on public transportation. I mean, it does seem like there's a, just a lot of heat around this debate and people who <laughs> step out of line, uh, yourself included, uh, are subject to quite a level of, of vitriol and character assassination. And I guess in Cass's case, even physical intimidation. Yeah, I think from Cass's point of view, she had probably never, the first time you like, publish something on this issue you experience like a wave you probably haven't experienced before especially if you're on the left uh yeah. now Cass had had published the interim cast review but this was this was the real deal so i'm sure she got a wave of threats luckily 99.999 percent of online threats don't lead to violence if if that weren't the case jk rowling would not still be with us so i highly it's unlikely uh anyone will attack hillary well, she might be that. heading to prison though because didn't they just pass a hate speech <laughs> exactly, law right. against uh, where she where she belongs issues? right <laughs> um, uh, uh, i really I believe think that, the, the admonition to avoid public transit is really just a sign that like the car bombs of like the 60s and the 70s have really uh, fallen out of fashion right like <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's her uh, personal car can never be attacked it's merely exactly. you know, the subway system that's the problem I mean, I, it just, it, unfortunately, it doesn't surprise me. I, do, I don't think most mm -hmm. of the threats are legitimate, but to tell a target of threats, you shouldn't take these seriously. It's not, it's not reasonable. Let me bring up a couple more of the specific criticisms because, uh, you know, it's, it's not worth engaging with the, the, the trolls and the people issuing threats, but it is worth engaging the people who are actually trying to make an argument. And one of them is this group, Mermaids, which you referenced at the beginning of the, uh, of the show, uh, which I guess is a advocacy group for uh, transgender or gender questioning youth. And uh, their reaction here was that uh, they say, young people we have spoken to are concerned about what they have read, including the desire to understand why young people are tr trans. That's why in quotes. Um, and to place what feel like limits on gender expression, further pathologizing and medicalizing their identities. They also say they're frustrated with the lack of clarity, which has enabled uh, willful misinterpretation and the spread of misinformation. Um, and then they've got this interesting block quote from, I guess, one of the youth that they interviewed who said, I don't experience minority stress from lots of different opinions. I experience minority stress because there is open and vitriolic conversation about how we don't understand ourselves or our bodies, that we don't deserve to exist, and that, that we're somehow evil and perverted or manipulated by something evil and perverted. Uh, and then they go on to say that none of these limits that are being proposed by the cash review should be implemented. Um, you know, do, do you have any sympathy for the argument that uh, these this organization is making on behalf of the youth is that they don't need Hillary Cass pathologizing them, that this is just their identity and um, it, they don't really need to be studied and that th this is an infringement on their rights or their liberties. No, I mean, a 10 or an 11 year old being put on a medical treatment 
without much evidence underpinning it, you're not invalidating their identity. These kids aren't being put on blockers or hormones because they're trans. They're being put on blockers or hormones because they have a condition called gender dysphoria or gender incongruence. Uh, I can't imagine any way you could properly assess a kid without getting at that question of why they feel the way they do. And in any other context, if I go to a therapist and say, I'm feeling X, where X is depressed or anxious or suicidal, of course, they're going to try to help me understand why. Um, there's this weird carve out with gender dysphoria where the usual logics of, of compassionate care don't apply. I think a lot of this is adult trans people projecting horrible experiences they've had onto present youth gender medicine. Because it did used to be the case that, for instance, if you wanted to uh, as a, uh, be a trans woman who dressed in a male manner, like a tomboy, a trans woman, you might be not allowed to transition. They, they'd they wanted you to present in a very specific way, especially in the 60s and 70s early on. Doctors really took pride in generating like beautiful gender normative trans women who would just go settle down with a husband somewhere. There's this long history of like, yeah, patholiz patholicization and undue gatekeeping. But um, with kids, you, you need to understand where it's coming from or you just can't justify an intervention like this. And if it's coming from a deep place inside them that's unlikely to go away that's when just uh intervention is most justified so i get where they're coming from i just um yeah i don't i don't think it's feasible what they're calling for i mean is there any danger of any of this creeping from youths from kids to adults um because the one one aspect of the mermaids uh objection that i found kind of interesting um and maybe somewhat sympathetic to was this point on neurodivergence uh, as a libertarian i encounter a lot of neurodivergent individuals uh, <laughs> and, me like that right in front yeah. of me i'm right here God damn it. Uh, they, they say that they're concerned that the report implies that neurodivergent young people who are autistic or less trustworthy in articulating their trans identity than their neurotypical counterparts or that this capacity is limited until their, quote, early 20s. Um, I guess like, the, you know, that is one theme of the cast review is they she talks about the you know, co comorbidities, other psychological conditions that appear a lot with a transgender identity. And one of those appears to be being on the autism spectrum. Um, but like, I don't know, if, if you're on the autism spectrum and that makes you prone to being trans, does that really matter? It, it, isn't it just like, you know, people on the spectrum ha should be able to express their gender identity how they want to as well? Well, express their gender identity how they want to, yeah, but the question is giving them an individualized assessment that will help clinicians come to the you know most confident possible answer. So the, the full statement from the cast review reads, working this out, working gender identity stuff out, may take longer than it does for neurotypical individuals, making neurodiverse young people potentially vulnerable into their early 20s or longer because of their tendency to want black and white answers and their difficulty in tolerating uncertainty. So if you start as a journalist, start looking into youth gender medicine Monday morning, by Tuesday morning, this issue of autistic kids will come up because there is um, just they're disproportionately represented in this group. And there's legitimate like diagnostic issues just to make sure that they can provide informed consent. One thing you sometimes see with um, kids on the autism spectrum is it's really important to unpack with a kid like let's say you like to wear a dress. Does that mean you should transition? I think autistic kids are more likely to think, I like wearing dresses, therefore I have to be a girl. When mm. from a medical perspective, you should make sure that that's not all it is, that they like the feel of dresses or they they can't imagine a boy wearing a dress or cross-dressing. So being autistic shouldn't cut you off from being able to transition. It shouldn't be seen as like a, like a no-go zone, but I just think they do require more assessment in many mm -hmm. cases, depending on their specific circumstances. And it, it's compassionate to give us to them. I mean, on that theme, you mentioned earlier that there's some ways of looking at this question of being uh, gender non-conforming or non-binary that is regressive. So there's a cultural and social component to this separate from the medical component. I'm curious what you meant by that. I just, I, I think there's some examples especially in like teenage subcultures. And it's not my job to like police anyone's identity, but I think as adults, we are allowed to critique 15 year olds when it matters. Um, 
it seems like sometimes like some kids sometimes come out as non-binary because they just don't like male or female gender roles. Um, and you know, it, that might be adaptive in some places to create a third gender category in other mm-hmm. societies, third gender categories are often regressive. Like in the sense that if you're, if you're a Samoan boy who exhibits effeminate, uh, characteristics, they'll sort of shunt you into the role of Fafa Fine, which is a third gender. I'm not saying that's happening there because it's different if the kid wants to be that, but I just, I don't think 10 year olds always have a perfect grasp on who they are or 15 year olds. And I think in some cases, if, if a woman girl is adopting a non-binary identity because being a girl sucks and men cat call you and you get your period, um, speaking as the resident expert on the female experience on this podcast, um, <laughs> you just want to make sure that that stuff isn't really influencing their sense that this is who they are and will be forever. It doesn't mean they shouldn't transition. It's just all this comes back to they need a competent adult who is not invested in one particular outcome to talk to them about this stuff in some depth before major decisions are made. This has always really frustrated me a fair amount because it feels as though fourth wave feminism, but especially a lot of the gender identity discourse as done by activists, has really um, in some ways acted as if we ought to abandon the cause of making the existing genders um, more expansive in terms of what social roles might look like. And at least as a woman who enjoys um, being aggressive and assertive and smoking a few cigarettes and drinking and and giving guys shit a little bit and sometimes adopting more stereotypically masculine (laughs) traits, um, there's a certain sense of like, I feel so blessed to be uh, freed from uh, an overly rigid concept of what femininity must be. And I feel as though I'm able to, you know, be a woman and, and wear exactly what I want, but also be able to very much um, do all of the things that I want to do. And I feel lucky to live in the time that I do where that is available to me and in the place that I do. And so then for there to be this sense that, um, well, actually, we really need to rebel against these existing gender roles as opposed to continuing to broaden them more and allow more and more social freedom for people to express themselves however they want, that really tends to bother me an awful lot because it makes me think that like, oh, well, in the future, by dint of me choosing womanness, um, the thing that aligns with how I was born, is there also this sense or this implication that goes along with that, that um, I must ascribe to all of these other traits and adhere to them in a more rigid manner in a way that I thought we kind of abandoned over the last few decades. Yeah, Um, I think Oh, sorry. I was just going to say, I mean, I think that's that's better stated than I put it. It's also just like, like what does this new gender role do for the gender non-conforming 14-year-old female? Will it actually yeah. provide them any sort of lasting relief? Or at the end of the day, do they just need a, a, a different, more resilient way of understanding what it's like to have a female body in this world of ours? Yeah, completely. Um, you got to let the cat calls roll off of you. They're most interesting when you're pregnant because it's like very, you get some really creative ones. Um, I highly recommend it. Uh, the thing that I do want to bring us to before we wrap. Yeah, you're is, saying you highly recommend cat calling pregnant women? <laughs> I highly recommend getting pregnant, Jesse. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then uh, getting, getting cat calling. I'll do my best. Implant. Yeah. Um, it's just really interesting the creativity that comes out of the male brain at that time. Um, I do think I want to take us to the media criticism point and then wrap. You know, if CNN is basically refusing to cover this um, or making some editorial decision unbeknownst to us, um, deciding to maybe do a wait and see approach, to put it more charitably, yet we do have this activist class that has really co-opted the decision making of some of these major organizations um, like WPATH WPATH, um, and, um, you know, the AAP and all these things like what is the path forward for journalists who are covering this? Um, and do you have hope on this front or are you pretty um, defeated given what your mentions look like on a day-to-day basis? Oh, I mean, I don't care about, it. I'm, I'm not defeated at all. Again, like I got a contract to write a book about this. I'm very fortunate. Um, the path forward is to read what Emily Bazon wrote, Reuters. So I'll put it this way. Four years ago, I was- But even the Associated Press like style book tells us, you know, dictates that things be done a certain way. Like what hope is there for our industry at this point? Oh, there's hope just because like things are improving. I mean, 2020, I was one of the only left of center journalists, relatively mainstream, like writing about this in a critical way. Now Reuters has an investigative team. New York Times has a science desk writer, Azeen Gureshi, who I I think is doing a very good job. There was a Bazelon article. The Atlantic is, is after- a certain thing happened that caused them to not cover this issue for a while, and now they're they're doing it again. Um, <laughs> I, I just think there's general improvement, and this is becoming such a big issue across the pond and here that at a certain point, the real journalists are not going to be willing to carry water for activists anymore. Now, the problem is 
and I mentioned this in my dispatch article, this new phenomenon of like an identity vertical. So NBC News has an identity vertical dedicated to LGBT stuff. That's fine. They should. That should not be where their coverage of a scientific controversy is centered any more than I would trust a Zionist publication to give me an accurate understanding of what's going on on the ground in Gaza. Like, Don't talk about the free press that way, Jesse. <laughs> <laughs> Got you, Barry. Um, you so mean I, like, I, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, and I just think there's still going to be that really activist-infused reporting, but I think... I just, I know a lot of journalists who are now a lot, not a lot, a few who are really getting into this and find it to be an interesting controversy. So I think the, um, whatever the style books say, whatever weird shit CNN is doing, I think things are trending in the right direction. Well, with that, thank you so much for talking to us, Jesse Single. Thank you for having me. Welcome to our new segment, Just Ask Us Questions. You can write in at justaskusquestions at reason.com and we will take a look at it. And if it's interesting, respond to it. That's what we're going to do right now. Our first question comes from Mason. He says, hey, Liz Zach, been enjoying the podcast. Thanks for starting this. That being said, dot, dot, dot. Uh-oh. I think the conversation about policing both on your podcast with Peter Moskos and in society at large is missing a key perspective, anarcho-capitalism, especially as conceived by David Friedman and Bob Murphy. We often assume without question that the government must handle security. The political fight to fix the broken system often devolves into the hyper-partisan polls of ACAB and Blue Lives Matter. Why not consider privatizing police? Private property often provides its own security. So why not expand the private sector's role, especially in urban areas? We have examples of this working, like malls and private universities with their own police forces. Why isn't that part of the discussion? I'd love to hear at least some discussion of this radical third way on a Reason podcast. Well, here, here it is, Mason. We... You know, when we were speaking with uh, someone like Peter Moskos, our goal is to have a conversation about the reality on the ground in Liz's beloved New York City. Um, And New York City is a long way from anarcho-capitalism. We are, I'm at least I'm certainly open to those kinds of conversations. Um, I've produced a 30-minute documentary on this private autonomous zone in Honduras called Prospera, where uh, Liz and I visited, and they are they are using pr- a private security force to secure the land there as part of the agreement. Um, but they do still have pr- to like hew to criminal, you know, Honduras's criminal law. They right? do and that. That's a attitude to do that. Yes, yeah, so that's a. That's a consideration that anyone trying to set up some sort of autonomous zone is always going to have to consider is that issue of sovereignty. You're usually going to be existing under an umbrella of a more powerful sovereign power and going to have to negotiate what level of autonomy you can get from that sovereign. So that that's uh, for anyone interested in, you know, the mechanics of how that sort of negotiation might work. I, I can recommend that documentary. I can also recommend a uh, documentary that our producer John Osterhout made about uh, private policing, which we'll drop in the the show notes here, um, because uh, modern policing is a it it didn't always look uh, policing did not always look the way it looks now. There, were, especially in America, there were not always such um, kind of regimented police forces. It they there it often was kind of cobbled together. Uh, different uh, from different jurisdictions and it it wasn't so organized as it is now. So I don't know that there's going to be a return to that anytime soon, but it's some interesting history to consider. Uh, But uh, to the overall question, I'll just say, uh, you know, we're, we're we're interested in those kinds of conversations. We're also interested in just the, the reality on the ground right now and how we can kind of incrementally improve things so that we're not, on one hand, having police brutalize people un- without any sort of accountability, and on the other hand, not having total disorder that makes urban living unbearable. 
I am truthfully not interested, honestly, in the issue of private policing. I find David Friedman to be a good read and interesting as sort of a thought experiment. But when you exist in the realm of anarcho-capitalism, you frequently exist uh, far outside of the realm that a lot of us live in. Uh, and you become pretty detached from reality. So I think there's limited utility to that. And especially when we're talking with somebody like Peter Moskos, who's not like a libertarian world libertarian, he maybe has some civil libertarian tendencies here and there. But I think we would really be kind of wasting his time if we attempted to pull the conversation in this anarcho-capitalist direction. So that's how I approach it. I would note, though, that private police forces as a supplement to the existing policing that we have is actually something that's already being um, deployed sort of at, you know, ad hoc in some places in New York. I was in a coffee shop the other day and, you know, a lot of coffee shops in high crime areas, which ends up being many different neighborhoods, even really posh and wealthy ones, have just taken it upon themselves to hire their own security because they're like, you know what, we're a little bit sick of dealing with theft and we want a different solution other than having to lock up our wares. Um, so you walk into a Dwayne Reed or a CVS all over New York City, uh, you find that even like shampoo is locked up and you have to call an associate over to help you know, them free the, the goddamn shampoo. Uh, but some places have decided to take a different approach and to hire a security guard who waits at the door. Um, and I can sort of see why they do that. But, you know, I think that expecting that to be the solution that takes over for NYPD uh, and that operates and gives us better outcomes than the existing uh, sort of flawed outcomes that we have, I think that that's really operating in fantasy land, frankly. Yeah, I think that any that the level of autonomy that Mason is talking about there is just there's that's not happening in the foreseeable future in a yeah. city like New York. Um, it's going to be in more blank slate type places, whether it's yeah. the middle of the jungle in Honduras or, you know, here in Florida where I am, there's lots of you know, semi-privately governed special districts where they're, like you were saying, Liz, at least supplemented, sometimes all out, uh, you know, the securities provided by some private yeah, like board. Gated like, communities have been doing this for a long time, right? Like that's- Yeah, exactly. so that, that's the realm where it's like most likely to exist and, and grow uh, in, in the future if if we're we're interested in how those experiments play out. But yeah, that that comes with a certain level of- literal gatekeeping if you're talking about a gated community and just you know uh applying that to a city as as, as populated and uh full of um already existing interests let's say as new york um I think that's that's a non-starter. But yeah, the future will not be private police forces. The future will be like pathetic robocops, right? And we'll be, <laughs> you know, serve our littlest actions will be surveilled endlessly. And I'm not saying that I'm happy about that future. I'm just saying if we want to operate in reality, let's be very clear about where things are headed. <laughs> yeah. So for New York City, stop Unionized thinking about robots. privatize the police, start thinking about automate the police. So <laughs> yeah. th thank you very much, Mason, for the question. If you have a question for us, uh, again, just asking questions at reason.com. And we'll see you next week. Thanks for listening to Just Asking Questions. These conversations appear on Reason's YouTube channel and the Just Asking Questions podcast feed every Thursday. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts and please rate and review the show.